Hello, I'm Oliver Cornelli from the University of Cologne. I'm the Educational Officer of the ECMM, the European Confederation of Medical Mycology. The ECMM initiated a new program and that is a new set of guidelines on invasive fungal infections and that starts with mucomycosis and other rare diseases and then will, it will continue with other pathogens uh, throughout the next years. Since several groups are starting at the moment and since ECMM has a very specific um, structure how the guideline process should be uh, followed, um, I want to share with you information on exactly that and I'll do so with the example of the mucomycosis guideline because that is the one that is most advanced at the moment so that it's easy to see how exactly things should develop with the other guidelines that you might work on uh, too. And with that let me just switch over to the presentation. The guidelines do have coordinators two to four usually uh, for the mucomycosis clinical practice guideline this is myself for uh, infectious diseases and for the field of microbiology, it's Professor Aranaloka Chakrabarti from Chandigarh in India. And what you see is that we uh, want to have involvement of all regions of the world and that is reflected by the guideline coordinators as well as by the uh, guideline participants. And you as guideline contributors uh, and potential guideline authors uh, would actually at this point in time when you start working on the guideline only fill the slides which is largely filling tables and uh, at this stage you would actually not write text uh, that would come at a later stage and I will share the time frame with you in a moment. There is a definition of authorship that you are very familiar with because it's just the definition of the ICMJE and uh, we added two more criteria. One is we need you to be very responsive during the guideline process and the other is that we need uh, you to receive the training that you are currently receiving. And if there are any questions about the process, any questions about the training, please drop me an email. It's very easy to find my email address uh, through the website of the ECMM or just oliver.corneli at uk minus Köln, which is the K-O-E-L-N way of writing uh, the name of my city, dot D-E. So whoever fulfills all these six criteria will be an author on the guideline um, manuscript in the end. Who does not fulfill these six would still be um, regarded as a contributor and uh, unless somebody would never be involved and, and not work on anything uh, we, uh, we need to develop the guideline, then these very rare uh, occasions, but we need to keep that open, would be of course then not authors and not contributors uh, to the guideline. On the next slide, you see the time frame. Um, we did the first four lines so that there is work packages specified for each expert and now we have time until end of June to develop tabularized recommendations and there will be no face-to-face -face meetings. All that will be done via email or teleconferences or video conferences and, uh, and the other sequence of events you see here and if you are a contributor to a guideline you will have received a slide set, either this one, if it's the mucomycosis guideline, or another one uh, for the individual guidelines that we work on. Something that is not given on that table is that the board of the ECMM is currently negotiating and contemplating with other um, uh, scientific societies of whether they want to join or whether they want to wait and maybe endorse the guidelines once they are accomplished uh, or only participate in the guidelines during the public consultation phase that we will have uh, for this guideline currently planned in October 2018. 
So there might be other societies coming on board and doing this together with ACMED and every, every other society is actually really invited to consider this. So with that, I go into the guideline methodology. There are two independent evaluations. One is that must be looking very familiar to most of you, the strength of recommendation, uh, the SOR as, we, uh, 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 as an acronym, and the quality of evidence, the QOE. And we regard both as completely independent from each other. So there is that famous um, example that I'm just making use of here, and that would be in the table, the first line, where it says, people on planes, if they jump off a plane, they should use a parachute. And for that sequence, for that population, for the intention, you want to jump off the plane and you know, actually want to survive. Uh, and for the intervention, using a parachute. For that sequence, we would surely give a strong recommendation, an A recommendation, and it has never been randomized. So it's not an A1, although we likely are all convinced that a parachute in that situation is a... A uh, very good idea. Uh, we didn't find a reference for that and if we don't find a reference we always need to state that uh, but usually we would have references unless it's a made-up example and if that is the case then the reference would be um, listed references would be listed in that sixth column of that table and then we are, have an opportunity to, to put in comments uh, if we feel necessary as contributors or authors. The second example is a bit more close to our heart, I guess, and that is patient with a fever in that patient population, which is febrile. If your intention is to diagnose fungemia, then you should take blood cultures. And for that, we would give an A recommendation. Uh, but it has, again, never been tested in a randomized controlled trial. So it's an A2 because there are series and that would support a quality of evidence of level two and I made up the journal that doesn't exist and the author. On the next slide, this is the strength of recommendation that we are going to use in these guidelines. And you see three positive, grade A, B, and C, and you see grade D as the only recommendation against um, use of a diagnostic test or a treatment. Um, or whatever measure in a specific population and situation. And uh, A, B, and C uh, are um, defined by either strong, moderate, or marginal support of the group uh, for a recommendation. So the quality of evidence is given in levels 1, 2, and 3. And while level 1 is what it is in most of these grids, that is randomized controlled trials, the level three is at the other end, and that's largely opinions of respected authorities. And everything else is a level two. Everything else is in between these two extremes. That makes level two quite a mixed variety of different qualities of evidence. And to be most transparent in what exactly is the basis for giving a level two uh, uh, quality of evidence, we added a third digit to the um, letter and the number. We add an index. And the index, you might have seen that in guidelines that um, ECMM did together with ESCMIT on rare fungal infections about five years ago, and, uh, and uh, on Candida um, as well. So that index clarifies what exactly is the type of level two evidence here. And you see that if the evidence stems from a review or a systematic or non-systematic meta-analysis, then it would be a 2R, and it would be a 2T for transferred evidence from one population to the other. For example, you do have a trial in adults, you want to recommend something on that, let's say, drug being used for a specific um, pediatric population, and um, there's no study in pediatrics for that population, for, for that situation, so you would transfer the evidence from adults to pediatric, you could transfer from hematology to diabetics, etc., etc., and we see a lot of T's in that um, 
area of rare diseases where randomized invasive, uh, randomized uh, trials have uh, usually not been performed in the past. If it was a historic control where the evidence comes from, then the index would be H. For uncontrolled studies, it would be U. And it would be an A if there is only an abstract out there. We don't want to cite too many abstracts, but if there is really a decisive information that really would change something, but it's only an abstract format, then it would be a level 2A, even if it's the most wonderful randomized controlled trial until it's fully published and can fully be evaluated by the team, it would be a 2A um, level of evidence. Populations to be considered. There are a lot on here, but the last line is maybe the most important one where it says other. So for example, children means that we would, uh, of course, address neonates as a separate group if that is appropriate for the given fungal infection uh, under discussion. and. Uh, and then other practically really opens it up to any population that should be represented and dealt with in the guidelines. The search strings that you will use while finding, searching for literature, the search strings, please copy them onto that slide and add your search string just on the slide and we will collate all the different search strings to finally be able to explain what was the search strings used. And these two that are printed in black have already been used for this guideline. About literature access, all PDFs that we use during development of the guideline, all PDFs are being referenced in the column number six, uh, if you remember, of the um, tables need to be sent to uh, this email address to Susan Blosfeld and uh, you should suggest which folder they should go in the PDFs that you, that you used and send to Suzanne. I'll come back to the folder in a moment to explain what that means. It refers to the OneDrive that we use. It's a password protected um, repository or you actually would get or will have gotten already a, a link uh, that you can click on and then you are in that uh, in these folders of the respective guidelines. And when you send in a PDF, please let us know whether it should go into the microbiology folder or, or a pediatric folder or any other of the folders there. And you can suggest new folders, of course, if you miss something in that structure. Um, Please do not use review articles because usually we can avoid that by really going to the original source of the information, and not uh, using whatever is being said in a review and might be a carryover from another review, etc. Go down to the source, to the original publications, please, uh, and wherever that is possible. Literature that you cannot access. Um, please send the 8-digit PubMed ID number to Suzanne and the tree team will try to retrieve the PDF, will find it and put it on the OneDrive for the group of authors. This is how OneDrive looks if you follow the link to the mucomycosis OneDrive where you see from the top left um, where the current slide sets are in. If you click there, oh, it's not online. And from the top left, where the current slide sets are in, here is material stored for the introduction of the manuscript and for a potential editorial that might accompany the manuscript and describe some more on the, uh, on the uh, methodology, for example. And epidemiology, etc. Previously published guidelines on the topic, of course, we should store here and address them briefly. Um, when uh, writing the manuscript, uh, microbiology, etc., etc. You see something special here. There is a folder for entomophthora mycosis. Um, I expect that that folder, where is no document in there yet, will likely diversify and uh, be split into several folders, diagnostics and treatment, for example, maybe pediatrics. We'll see how that develops. And then you see all the other folders, surgery, review articles. Well, we can store them here 
although we likely won't use them and not reference them, we'll see how it develops uh, during the process and correspondence. So before we come to the slides that you actually should fill, um, I'd like to share with you our idea of track changes mode, which PowerPoint doesn't offer. Uh, so we made something up ourselves, a color code. Uh, green is information that Arna Loke or myself would share, or the other groups, the other coordinators would share with the uh, contributors. And so it's some sort of remarks and, uh, and maybe somewhere asking for help on a slide or so, things like that. Then red font is the color that the contributors, actually then they are authors, uh, should use. So write with the red font into the slides. The coordinators will convert red font to blue font and say, okay, we went through it, it's formatted properly, etc. And there's no, well, whatever, duplication. Uh, so it's ripe for discussion in the group. And that is indicated by blue font. And once things have been discussed and once the group agreed on a letter and a number for the uh, for the strength of recommendation, the level of evidence, then if it's a level two evidence, they all need to come with an index. So once all that is done, then the um, guideline coordinator would convert blue into black, and black is what has been discussed. And if there is new evidence coming up, then we could, of course, um, then change black back and bring it back into discussion. I don't expect that to happen very often, but we would have the freedom to do so. On the next slides, there are all the contributors uh, to the different chapters and from the different specialties. For example, clinical microbiology is here, pathology, radiology, infectious diseases, surgery. We still need more surgeons. We invited three answer pending for mucomycosis, but we need more surgeons who are experienced in treatment of other rare modes, for example. Uh, to support us and to bring in the surgical expertise. So please recommend surgeons, just drop me a line. Uh, if you know somebody, maybe from your hospital or from some other place, um, who should be considered uh, to contribute to the guideline. Pediatrics, hematology, intensive care, dermatology, pharmacology, and that was all the experts on this guideline. It's a large group, it's almost 80. And uh, they represent not only these different uh, medical specialties and scientific areas, they do represent all regions of the world uh, where we follow actually the United Nations definition of regions and all are represented in all of the guidelines. And that is very, very important to ECMM because the recommendations should really be applicable to microbiologists, to clinicians, to those who care for these patients uh, in very different settings, not only in Europe, not only in the US, but in all parts of the world. Um, you will see that coming up repeatedly during the uh, reminder of the tutorial. One other aspect important is considerations on patient involvement. So if you know of a patient advocacy group or other ways how we can involve patients into the guideline development, then please uh, enter these thoughts here in red font so that we see it and can discuss it and maybe reach out then uh, to ideally reach out to these organizations or uh, to involve patients. This slide is meant for collecting all the information on epidemiology and we would actually do this by country or by region, whatever the literature provides, whatever we can find would go on here, uh, numbers practically, and they will likely come with a number of different denominators. So we just collect everything here uh, with the references, of course, and then we want to fill in uh, that I hope it can be done, but I'm optimistic. want to fill in that information uh, on the next slide, the epidemiology world map. We could do regional maps or we could do different maps for different pathogens, of course. And uh, so this is just a starting point. We might duplicate that uh, slide for uh, different subpopulations or subgroups within mucomycosis. 
For example, we'll have a separate one for anthomorphomycosis, I guess. Here we just put on the recent guidelines on mucomycosis with the reference uh, so that we don't forget to uh, address them when we finally write the paper. And this is the first uh, real slide now with a table. It's a slide with a seven column table and one issue is really, really important. You should not change the sequence of the columns of the table. So we can add information in right into the table, red font. We can add new lines to the table, but we can never change the order, the sequence of the columns, because there is a certain logic in there from left to right. And I will just lead you through the first example here. Um, it's a microbiological slide, and the topic is on conventional methods. So in any population, if your intention is to diagnose mucormycosis, and you want to do this by the intervention of direct microscopy, preferably using optical brightness. And for that sequence, uh, we currently have under discussion an A to U strength of recommendation and level of evidence. And then here the reference is supporting the 2U. And maybe during the process we'll find something newer in addition to, to, to these, and we would add that, of course, in red font. You would actually edit, or, or myself, because I'll be working on the guideline too, of course. And then we do have commons on the right side. There are commons in blue. Uh, they are open for discussion. And there are things that should not be missed, like the branching angle or the high full diameter. Uh, we really want to have that in the um, final publication, want to address that. And there is a question from one of the co-authors, LW, the initials, and he uh, brought up that, um, uh, that, that uh, aspect given in red font. Next line, here is a... Again, any population, intention diagnosed, but this time it's about culture. Yes, culture is recommended strongly, but there is no series on that. It's only opinions. So I, I would expect that we find some series where culture has been used during the last year, since 2007. And, uh, and there are some aspects for discussion um, in the right color, which is red in that case. So I'd like to flip through the next couple of slides because the general principle is always the same. And it's the same for diagnostics, it's the same for treatment. So I flip through here, serology, and you see there is already a vivid discussion going on. You can see all the red font and the blue font, and then other uh, diagnostic techniques or aspects. And at the end, Oh, here's a here's a comment from Professor Chakrabarti. He's asking, should we have a separate slide on on autopsy? So we are waiting for some red font aspects in in, in red font typed uh, comments on that uh, to finally decide on whether we create a new slide, a new separate pathology slide on autopsy only. Imaging studies and. Once we have all the information and all the diagnostics, then we can we can draw the ideal diagnostic flowchart with all options available. So no resources that are limited or anything, but all the tests in your house, what would be the ideal pathway? And then on the next slide, we do have the restricted options. One restricted option that everybody has is I try to culture the pathogen, but it didn't grow. So I only have the clinical picture or only the histology and how do I move forward? Uh, that would be the most simple uh, restricted option that everyone who treats these patients knows of. And there could be other options like I don't have PCR or whatever. So we will see and we will cross out boxes from the ideal pathway to come to the restricted options pathways. It will be more than one, I guess, and it should be applicable to um, per region or per country, we'll see. It will be pretty diverse, I guess. So with that, we are into the treatment um, area. Starts with prophylaxis, and I flipped through these slides as well. Fever-driven, diagnosis-driven, 
first line salvage treatment and treatment other so if there is anything that we missed so far could go in here treatment duration surgery and then specific patient settings like hematology oncology uh, pediatrics children including neonates there was solid organ transplants hiv and aids diabetes trauma patients very important population uh, amongst the others adjunctive drugs and general management and we found some information on hyperbaric oxygen we'll try to um, to dig into that and, uh, and find more uh, information about that TDM uh, that's a new slide therefore there's almost nothing on there but somebody said oh we really should say something about posaconazole TDM yeah that's probably right and it's open for uh, additions and open for discussion at the moment and when we have all the treatment information we will do the same as we did with the diagnostics we do an all options available treatment flowchart and then we cross out boxes like I don't have this drug or I don't have that drug and we uh, come up with restricted options flow charts again that'll be a plural for sure uh, with uh, all different types of restrictions that uh, clinicians around the world might face coming to the end of the session there are four or five more slides to share uh, one is that we want to come up with the five, five most important unmet needs because we are such a large group so uh, once the uh, guideline is done we shouldn't just go home split and uh, reconvene in five years for an update or something we should actually stay together and, and and do something for our patients with mucomycosis and for that we need the five most important tasks and that would be the five most important unmet needs and there are with the next slides you will see some certain overlap for example constraints in therapy that might overlap with the previous slide and uh, but it was something that was proposed as something as, as a topic that we really should uh, say something about and uh, we're of course ECMM is absolutely open to the suggestions so there is a slide on constraints in therapy financial implications there's a slide on that there is the last slide on the five immediate next research questions maybe we have 10 but we would prioritize like five and uh, and advocate for uh, grant money and try to find support to work on and maybe eventually even solve these five next research questions while people around the world hopefully use the guideline find it very practical and can refer to these very very transparent tables that immediately help if there is a clinical microbiological so a management question on mucormycosis and the same is true and the same um, uh, slide sets practically are there with the same structure for all the other fungal infections that we want to deal with with that i remain at your disposition please drop me a line if there is a need for any further clarification if there are thoughts that we missed so far in the guideline grid please let me know and i wish you as a contributor and author finally on one of the guidelines success and hope that there will be quite some fun in there you will get in contact with a lot of interesting colleagues during the process we do have about well 280 close to 300 authors across the guidelines so it's a very very interesting group from all areas of the world from all regions and it's actually fun doing these guidelines and preparing these transparent um, tables that finally will really be helpful to those who manage these infections on a daily basis. Thank you very much and have a nice day.